Welcome back to Principles of Microeconomic Theory with me, Dr. Craig Webb. In the last two videos, we've looked at demand and supply. And now that we've covered the basics of these, in this video, we'll look at the idea of an equilibrium. This is pretty powerful stuff, actually, even though it's quite simple, because it means we'll be able to make predictions about the market price and also we'll be able to make predictions about how the market price changes as other factors change in the economy. So let's get started. In the last two videos, we've developed the idea of demand and supply by looking at the market for coffee. The estimated linear demand function was this and the estimated linear supply function was this. To represent these graphically, we fixed the value of some of these variables, taking the price of sugar to be 20 cents, the consumer's income to be 35, and the price of cocoa to be $3. This gave expressions for the demand curve and the supply curve, and allowed us to produce this diagram, where remember that price goes on the vertical axis and quantity goes on the horizontal. An important thing to notice is that the price of coffee is determined exogenously. That is, it's determined outside of our model. Neither the consumer nor the firm has any power to affect the market price. This is what we mean when we say we are analysing a competitive market. Consumers and firms simply observe the price and respond. So let's see what happens at different price levels. If the price is $3, per pound of coffee, then the market demand is 9 million tonnes and the supply is 10.5 million tonnes. So firms want to sell more than they actually can. We call this an excess supply of 1.5 million tonnes. This seems like an unstable situation really, with mountains of coffee having to be stored or wasted the price seems to be too high. So we might expect some pressure on the market to change, even though we don't model this explicitly. Now consider what happens if the market price is $1 per pound of coffee. In this case, demand is 11 and supply is 9.5. So everything supplied to the market does get sold, but there's going to be some upset consumers here the 11 million tonnes of coffee being demanded will not entirely be met. We call this a situation of excess demand and say there is excess demand of 1.5 million tonnes of coffee. Again, this situation seems unstable. Given the price, firms won't change their mind and neither will consumers. But what could change here is the price in the market, again via some forces that are outside of our model. Finally, let's have a look at an equilibrium. And I suspect you can see where this is going. Suppose that the market price of coffee is $2 per pound. In this case, demand is 10 and supply is 10. Zero excess demand, zero excess supply, demand equals supply. This is what we call an equilibrium. We'll say that $2 is the equilibrium price. And this reminds us that it's price that's doing the heavy lifting here and making this magic situation of an equilibrium happen. Let's just pause to think about how we've been analysing this market so far. The market price is determined outside of our model. So we just take this as given and we look at how consumers and firms respond in any given situation. Consumers and firms are totally free to act in their own best interest. They're not being coerced at all. We've seen that for different market price levels, sometimes we'll get excess demand and sometimes we'll get excess supply. And we had the idea that in both of these situations, there was this instability and we had the sense that the market price might change. But if the market price does its job just right, so we have an equilibrium price, then everything that's being demanded is available and everything supplied to the market is sold. Demand equals supply, the market's clear. Now this is a situation that seems quite stable. And because of this, economists use the idea of an equilibrium as our prediction. We are going to predict that equilibrium happens in this market. Now that we have a way of predicting what the price in a market will be, the equilibrium price, we can push this further and analyse the effects of changing other variables. For instance, what happens if the price of cocoa changes or the consumer's income changes? 
the current equilibrium price will probably no longer be an equilibrium price because those demand curves might shift or those supply curves might shift. So let's look at the details for doing this. This exercise is called comparative statics because we're essentially comparing different static snapshots of the market. Let's do this now. To produce the diagram of our demand and supply curves, we assumed that the price of sugar was fixed at 20 cents, the consumer's income was fixed at 35, and that the price of cocoa was fixed at $3. Now let's suppose the price of cocoa increases to $6. This is called a shock to supply. We've analysed this in a previous video, and we've seen that it causes the supply curve to shift from the pink line S to the orange line S prime, which has equation Q equals 8.4 plus 0.5 times the price. And of course, we've drawn the inverse of this. So what happens now? Well, $2 is no longer an equilibrium price. We have excess demand. By the same arguments as before, if the price is not an equilibrium price, then we imagine there's some pressure for it to change. Solving for the new equilibrium price, we see that this is $2.40 per pound of coffee. And at this level, demand and supply are both equal to 9.6. So now we have a solid prediction. If the price of cocoa increases, then the equilibrium price of coffee increases and sales of coffee decrease. So that concludes our treatment of demand, supply and equilibrium for now. We're going to revisit consumer demand later in the course. In these first three videos, we've taken the idea of demand really as an empirical relationship between the price of a good and what the consumer wants. And we haven't really asked how should the consumer behave? What does rational behaviour mean? So we've been following what's called a classical approach, assuming an em empirical relationship between these variables and then studying what happens. Can we make predictions? Can we change those predictions as other variables change? Later in the course, we'll look at the neoclassical approach to microeconomics or the new approach. And this starts from a very primitive assumptions about consumer behavior. What does it mean to make rational choices? And from there, builds the theory of demand as a consequence of these basic ideas. So there's lots to look forward to in the course. And I can't wait. But in the meantime, take care.